Hello everyone, welcome back. In today's video, we're going to solve some more problems from, from paper 2 and we have already discussed till question number 4. So today we'll start discussing from question 5 and the question is from electrostatics. So we have a point dipole, P0, having a moment of inertia I about the axis passing through its center. It is kept at a distance of small r from the center of a spherical shell whose radius is capital R. The surface charge density sigma is uniformly distributed on the spherical shell. The dipole is initially oriented at a small angle theta as shown in the figure while staying at a distance of r. So we have to assume the dipole is constantly at a distance of r. The dipole is free to rotate about its center. So if it is released from rest, then which of the following statements are correct? So we have to analyze if the dipole will undergo small oscillations or not. Okay. Okay, guys. So firstly, the sphere is given to uh, have a uniform surface charge density of plus sigma. So at any general r from the center of the sphere, the electric field is going to be kq by r squared. So which I can also write it in this manner that the charge on the surface of the sphere is sigma 4 pi capital R squared. Uh, and this simplifies as sigma r squared divided by small r squared and the electric field inside the shell is obviously zero. So now if you observe in the first question, they're saying the dipole will undergo small oscillations at any finite value of r. So this you can automatically reject because in order for the dipole to rotate, there needs to be an external electric field that can apply a torque on it. Whereas if you keep the dipole inside the sphere, there is no electric force over there. So saying that it will perform oscillations for any r will be wrong. Okay. Okay guys. So now we have a dipole, okay, which is oriented at an angle of theta along this line connecting the center of the sphere. This distance is given to be small r. So now the thing is guys, the dimensions of this dipole is actually tiny in comparison to the sphere. So uh, a more correct representation would be something like this. Okay. So this is how the dipole is looking like. So now if you analyze a field due to the shell at this point, guys, it will roughly turn out to be uniform. So now if we zoom in on the dipole, so the electric field here for the purpose of torque analysis uh, is equal to sigma r squared divided by small r squared, uh, even though at the negative charge, the electric field will be slightly greater in magnitude uh, because it is closer to the sphere. But the thing is, for the purpose of torque analysis, we can say that we can treat the electric field as uniform. So we can say that the electric field near the point dipole is going to be sigma r squared divided by small r squared. And the dipole moment vector makes an angle of theta with the electric field. Now guys, theta is measured in the counterclockwise sense. The dipole moment vector is in this direction and E vector is in this direction. If you do P cross E, you'll get the direction to be into the plane. So the torque is trying to decrease the angle theta, right? So we can say that firstly, the torque is equal to P cross E. P times the electric field times sine of theta. Uh, and this would be equal to minus I alpha. And I'm going to write alpha as d2 theta upon dt square. Okay, and again, the minus because the torque is trying to reduce the angle theta or opposite to the direction of theta. Okay, and from uh, there would be an epsilon not in the denominator as well, guys. After bringing the terms to one side, we'll get this expression for the angular acceleration versus theta. Now, if I consider small oscillations, when, then we can approximate sine theta to be roughly equal to theta. And as you can see, this is true for any r greater than capital R. It has nothing to do with small r. So option B will be correct. So now they're asking us about the angular frequency at small r equals 2r and small r equals 10r. So now the angular frequency guys, it's just a square root of this term. So if you put small r equals 2r, you'll get a 4 in the denominator. So option C is wrong. And if you put small r equals 10r, you'll get a 100 in the denominator. So sigma p naught upon 100 epsilon naught i would be correct. So the answer to this question is v comma d. So now let's move on to the next question. So this is a problem from fluid mechanics. A table tennis ball whose radii is given to be uh, this value. So this is 1.5 centimeters, right? So it's firstly a very small ball and it has a mass of this particular value. Uh, so it's given that it is slowly pushed down, which means its velocity, we can assume it to be zero, into a swimming pool of depth 0 0.7 meters below the water surface. And then it is released from rest. It emerges from the water surface at a speed of V without getting wet which means we can assume its mass to remain unchanged and it rises up to a height of capital H. Okay, so then we have to answer these following questions. So now we cannot neglect viscosity in this question. Uh, in the first question, they're saying the work done in pushing the ball to the depth D. So again, in the first line, they're saying we are slowly pushing it uh, down into the swimming pool. Now guys, viscous forces only start acting if the ball has some finite velocity, right? Because that is what Stokes law tells us, right? It tells us that the viscous force, viscous force acting on a spherical ball moving with a velocity of V is six pi eta RV. So if I push the ball in very slowly, then 
then the viscous force is going to be zero, right? Okay, guys, so in the first question, they're asking the work that we have to do in order to push the ball to a depth of D. Okay, guys, so uh, again, we start from the fluid surface and then we move a distance of 0.7 meters. Okay, guys, so first, let's just figure out the forces on the ball while it is inside the liquid. So first, let's figure out the Bowen force. So the Bowen force will be the volume of the ball, which is 4 by 3 pi r cubed times the density of the liquid times G right okay and you can substitute the values and this turns out to be 99 by 7 times 10 power minus now we have the weight of the ball which is mass multiplied by g so this turns out to be 22 by 7 into 10 power minus 2 and if you observe the net force is in the vertically upward direction and it is equal to 77 divided by 7 times 10 power minus 2 so i'll just write down the net force acting on the ball and this comes out to be 0 0.11 newton okay now guys for the first question uh, we are pushing the ball in very slowly right which means the viscous forces could be neglected uh, which means for option a in which we have to find the work done by the agent this would just turn out to be f agent uh, multiplied by the distance d now f agent in this case would be equal to the net external force force acting on the ball b which is 0 0.11 newton and that will be 0 0.11 times 0 0.7 which which is the distance through which the ball was pushed and this comes out to be 0 0.077 joules okay now it's very easy to solve it this way guys but uh, i also wanted to discuss a slightly different way now as the ball was actually present here initially right okay so this is method number two okay and this method is basically taking the pool and the ball as one single system now the advantage of doing this is that now the buoyancy is an internal force now as buoyancy is first of all applied by the fluid on this ball in the upward direction right so obviously the ball will apply the same force of f on the fluid now if i take both of them as the system then what will happen is the buoyancy is an internal force now so now if i apply the work energy theorem i can say that the total change in potential energy plus delta k delta u plus delta k equals work done by all the forces but now as i I took both of them as a system I don't have to consider the work done by buoyancy force and I can just say this is equal to the work done by the external agent and obviously between the first point and the second point we are carrying the ball very slowly the delta k can be taken as zero so now all we have to do is figure out the change in gravitational potential energy of the pool and the ball because we took both of them as a system now guys for the ball it's actually very simple the ball it was initially present at, the, at this particular point and now it went down by a distance of 0 0.7 so the change in potential energy of the ball is minus mgh so now the thing is what is the change in potential energy of the fluid for that what i'm going to do is i'm going to color this ball with black color so what the black color actually means is that so imagine it like vacuum so basically there is no fluid there so it's an empty spherical hole so initially the ball was present at this black location right so there was no fluid there but in the final stage uh, the ball is at this location which is at a distance of 0 0.7 meters downwards so the thing is what is happening to the fluid in this case you could say that there was some fluid that was present at this particular location and that went up by the same amount of 0 0.7 meters so that's the idea that we'll be using here so so you can either say that a negative mass of fluid went down by a distance of 0 0.7 meters or you can say that a fluid of the same mass went up by a distance of 0 0.7 meters so obviously as the fluid is rising the potential energy of the fluid is rising so now let's say the mass of uh, this much fluid is m dash m dash is going to be the volume of the sphere multiplied by the density of the fluid right so this fluid ball is rising up by a distance of 0 0.7 meters so which means the increase in potential energy of the fluid is going to be m dash g h now guys what is m dash it is uh, the volume of the sphere times the density of the liquid times g h now v rho l g is the Bowen force right so i can write this as the Bowen force as well and this would be equal to the work done by the external agent so i mean in this question this method is not necessary but but if you solve pathfinder mcq question number two if you use this method it, it's very easy to solve the question okay like the standard method will take you a lot of time in that so now again guys uh, as you can see this turns out to be exactly the same as this particular value right uh, fb minus mg is the upward force which was 0 0.11 newton multiplied by h uh, is the w agent so it's the exact same result as the value over here so that was the discussion for option a and option b they're saying if we neglect the viscous forces then the speed v is 7 meter per second and v is the speed guys when the ball emerges from the water surface okay now guys i am not trying to scare you guys but i think the answer to this question is slightly wrong uh, but again it's it's still going to be 0 0.7 only but so let's say this is the ball right let's duplicate this and in the final situation guys this is the situation that we want guys we want the ball to come out of the surface completely so if you observe something the center of mass of the ball actually went up by a distance of 0 0.7 plus the radius of the smaller sphere 
right? Now the thing is, yes, uh, the radius of the sphere is 1.5 centimeters, okay? But let's just consider it for our analysis, right? We're not losing anything. Again, we'll use the same principle that we used in the last question. So let's say the velocity when it comes outside is V. Initially, this was a state. So now the thing is, guys, there is no external agent doing any work uh, in the system. Again, my system is the pool plus the ball. So here, the work done by all forces is zero, uh, which means energy is conserved. Again, guys, we're not taking viscosity into account, right? Because that's what they wanted us to do. So basically, we can say delta U plus delta K equals zero. Now, guys, what is a change in potential energy? First, let's write it down for the ball because that's the easiest. So the center of mass of the ball, it went up by 0 0.7 plus this radius of the sphere R, right? So the change in the gravitational potential energy of the red ball is mg h plus R. Now, if you neglect this R, then you'll get the answer of 7 meter per second. But uh, we'll get into that a bit later. Now let's talk about the change in potential energy of the fluid. Now guys, when the ball actually comes outside, yes, the free surface of the fluid is going to descend by a small amount. But the thing is, as the spool is extremely large, and the volume of the fluid inside is extremely large in comparison to the volume of the ball, the decrease in the height of the surface is not going to be that much. Okay, so now, now let's talk about the fluid. And for, for the fluid, again, I'm assuming a black ball over here, indicating there is no fluid over here. And finally, it is completely filled, right? Now, where does the fluid come from? It comes from the free surface, right? So the free surface fluid dropped down by a little bit, and that fluid came and filled up this vacuum. Now, guys, I'm going to draw a horizontal line over here. And let's say this is the fluid, and this part of the fluid that I'm marking with the red color. Let's assume that is the fluid that came and filled this black hole. So what is the change in potential energy? So initially the mass was present over here and finally it is at a depth of 0 0.7 meters. So the fluid potential energy decreased by m dash g h. Okay, so this is the fluid change in potential energy. Now the change in kinetic energy is half mv squared uh, and this would be equal to zero. So this is the uh, energy conservation equation. Okay guys, so now uh, if I substitute all the values in uh, and here for, as you can see for the h plus r term, it is 0 0.7 meters plus the radius, which is 0 0.015 meters. So, and if you calculate it with these values, then the answer turns out to be very close to seven, which is 6.978 meter per second. Now, seven meter per second would be the answer if the ball is at this particular location, because in this case, the gravitational potential energy difference is going to be mgh. Uh, but if I assume the ball to be outside, then I have to put h plus r over here. And, and my answer turns out to be 6.978 meter per second, okay? Which is again, obviously close to seven, so that would be correct. So now the thing is, uh, what is the maximum height reach? So that is pretty simple, guys. So as the ball is outside of the fluid, its velocity is seven meter per second. So the maximum height reached, uh, as the only force acting on the ball is gravity, it'll be V squared by 2G. And this turns out to be 2.45 meters. So, the, so option C is clearly wrong. Okay, so now let's talk about option D. So this is the problem which most people have doubts about. So here what they're asking is the ratio of the magnitudes of the net force excluding the viscous force. Now as the net force excluding the viscous force is this particular force over here, that is 0.11 Newton. So this part is actually 0.11 Newton to the maximum viscous force in water is 500 by 9. Now again, uh, guys, the viscous force in this case is given to us, is given to us by Stokes law, which is 6 pi eta RV right? Um, obviously, the max viscous force would correspond to the max velocity case, right? Now, as the ball is uh, moving up, it is accelerating, right? And when it is about to go out, this is a situation when the velocity would be maximum. Now, guys, as we discussed earlier, when the ball is about to leave the surface, its velocity is 7 meter per second. So, let's try to figure out the viscous force for that 7 meter per second case. Okay, guys, so the function, this is how the function of the viscous force with the velocity looks like. If you simplify this expression, this is the coefficient of V that we get. So if you observe something, this is an extremely tiny force. So even if you take V equal to seven, let's say, so even if you assume the velocity is seven meter per second, the viscous force turns out to be 0 0.00198 Newtons. This is going to be roughly 0.002 Newton. So now if you take the ratio of these two terms, the answer comes out to 55.55. So basically the upward force is 55 times stronger than the viscous force. So majorly the velocity, final velocity will be decided by this force itself. So even if you neglect these terms, the answer should approximately come, turn out to be the same. And that's the logic that most people have used. And that is absolutely correct. And we'll confirm it by solving the differential equation as well. Okay, so if I assume this to be the case, that is when the ball is just... Uh, about to leave the surface, its velocity is 7 meter per second. So then the answer for option D turns out to be 0 0.11 divided by 0 0.00198. And if you simplify this a bit, you'll get the answer as 500 by 9, which is what they provided in option D. Now, as logically speaking, the velocity is going to be less than 7. And that we know, right? By Why? Because the 
viscous force is going to decelerate it a bit. So if you are being extremely strict, then option D would be wrong. But uh, hear me out. If let's say, so 500 by 9 is 55.55. If the actual answer like that we get after solving the differential equation turns out to be 55 point something, then is it actually wrong? Because um, because the thing is, first, you don't have a scientific calculator, right, in the exam. There is no way you can actually find out the velocity sitting there at the exam hall. So the thing is, if this turns out to be around 55, option D should be absolutely correct, right? Practically speaking, option D should be absolutely correct. So let's try to get the actual solution. So for that, we'll obviously have to solve the differential equation. And for that, let's come back to this page. Okay, guys, so for that, we have to first write down the force balance equation. So first, we have a net upward force of 0.11 Newton. And then we have a viscous force, which is opposing this motion, whose magnitude we figured out to be 198 divided by 7 into 10 power minus 5 times V. So this is the, so this is the viscous force, okay? So now the thing is, let's say its acceleration is... Uh, a in the upward direction. Uh, so its acceleration, we can write it as the net force, net upward force divided by the mass of the ball. Okay. Okay, guys. So once you simplify it a bit, you'll get the acceleration as this particular value. So now what we, so now we'll obviously set acceleration as V dV by dy. And now we'll separate the variables on both sides. So it'll be V dV upon 35 minus 0 0.09 V equals dy. So now we are going to integrate on both sides. So the limits uh, at y equal to zero, the ball is at a depth of um, 0.7 meters, right? So its velocity will be zero. And when it is about to leave, and when it is about to leave the su uh, surface, the distance it travel from the original position should be 0 0.7 meters, right? And at this location, let's say the velocity is V. This V is what we are trying to find. Okay, now guys, this integral is we need like a scientific calculator to calculate the limits and all. Okay guys, so for calculating this integral, I used uh, Wolfram Alpha. So as you can see, so this integral, I inputted into the calculator. Okay, and here as I, I set the limits from zero to V, and then I did limit V tending to 6.96. So 6.96 is a hit and trial value, okay? And when I input it 6.96, the answer comes out to be 0.700392. So that is very close to 0.9. So the solution to this equation is that V equals 6.96 meter per second. Or basically when the, or in short, when the ball travels up by a distance of 0.7 meters, the velocity turns out to be 6.96. And that is as good as saying it is almost seven meter per second. So the viscous force, even from the analytical solution, we can prove that it has very negligible effects uh, in determining the final velocity. So option D should 100% be correct because there is no way you can actually figure out the value of V. You have to go by assumptions that the viscous force is small, extremely tiny in comparison to the 0.11 force. And therefore, the maximum viscous force, you can say it is 0.00198. So I think option D should be correct. Now, if you're being extremely strict, then the option D would be wrong, right? And we can calculate that value as well. So this 500 by 9 was for 7 meter per second, right? So if I multiply this with 7 and divide it with 6.96, this should actually give the correct answer. And this turns out to be 55.87. So it's it's pretty much the same value. Now, guys, there is no way in hell you can actually determine this without a calculator, guys. So, so therefore, A, B, D should clearly be correct. Now, the question as to should A, B be the correct answer or not, uh, it's up to IIT, I don't know. So with that, now let's move to the next question. So this is problem number seven, guys. So this question is from motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field. We have a positive singly ionized atom. So singly ionized meaning one electron was taken out from the atom, which means it has a charge of plus E. And the mass number is given to be AM is accelerated from rest from a voltage of 192 volts. And after gaining some kinetic energy, it enters a rectangular region whose width is W and the magnetic field is 0.1 kcap coming out of the page. The ion finally hits a detector at a distance x below its starting trajectory and the mass of neutron and proton both are given to be this particular value. Charge of the electron is given to be this. So we have to talk about H plus and AM corresponding to 144 and AM corresponding to 196. So, so first we'll solve for a general value of the mass number. So again, guys, it's given that the particle was accelerated by 192 volts. Okay, guys, so now the thing is the particle is about to enter the region and it is entering perpendicular to this vertical line. We know that the, when the velocity and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, the trajectory of the particle is going to be a circle. So the center of the circle will obviously lie somewhere along this vertical line, right? And let's say it's somewhere over here. Now, as a radius of this circular trajectory, the formula is pretty straightforward forward, it is mv over qb. As the accelerated potential is given to us, we'll manipulate mv, which is the momentum in terms of kinetic energy. So this is going to be square root of 2m 
Ke and divided by Eb. Now, as the kinetic energy of the electron, uh, as it is accelerated across a potential of 192 volts, it is going to be E multiplied by 192. Okay. And guys, the mass of the atom, we can say it is the mass number, which is basically the number of neutrons plus the number of protons multiplied by mass of each proton or neutron. So the mass is going to be the mass of individual neutron or proton uh, times the mass number. Let's just call the mass number as A. And this multiplied by uh, now square root of E. I'm going to cancel with the denominator, guys. So there will be a root E in the denominator and there will be a 192 volt in the numerator and also there will be a 0.1 Tesla in the denominator. So this whole thing divided by 0.1 and there's a square root over here. Okay, okay guys, and once you solve this expression, uh, you'll get this value for the radius of the path. This is in terms of meter. So if I convert it into centimeters, it'll just be two root A centimeters. Now guys, this distance X that they're asking about is the distance between the initial line of motion and the point where the ion exits the region. And this is actually nothing but twice the radius of the trajectory right and this is the exit line so the distance of this exit line from the original line is what they're asking as x so x is actually nothing but twice the radii so now in option one they're saying the value of x for h plus ion okay so uh, so guys uh, h plus ion contains one zero neutrons one proton and zero electrons right so the mass number is going to be one so if i said a, a equals one for option a uh, X turns out to be four centimeters, right? Two into two centimeters. So that'll be four centimeters. So option A is correct. Now the value of X for AM equals 144. So if I put AM equals 144, X turns out to be uh, 12 twos are 24. So 24 times two is 48 centimeters. So option B is also correct. Now for option C, they're asking about AM equals 196 guys. So AM for AM corresponding to X equals one, the value of X uh, was actually equal to four centimeters. And for AM corresponding to 196, the radius uh, for this case is two root 196. So this is 28 centimeters. So, and double of 28 is 56 centimeters. Now they're asking the difference between the uh, these two points and that is going to be 52 centimeters. So option C is therefore wrong. Now they're asking us about the minimum width uh, in the case for AM equals 196. Now guys, if we observe uh, this diagram over here, let's not assume where the center is. The minimum will be corresponding to this particular case over here, right? Because uh, if we increase the radius by even a little bit, uh, the particle will escape the region, right? So in the minimum width case, the width, as you can see, should just be equal to the radius of the circle. Uh, and the radius is nothing but 2 root a. And this should be equal to w. Uh, a is given to be 196 in this question, which means width has to be equal to 28 centimeters. So this is the answer to question D, but they have given the answer as 56. So that would be wrong as well. So the answer to this question is A comma B. Okay. So now let's move to the next question. Okay, guys. So this is problem number eight. Now as this question is very straightforward, but uh, a lot of people actually made a very interesting silly error in this question. And I'll prove it with an example why that is wrong. Okay. So first let's discuss the question. So in this question, we have a cone that is measured using a scale whose least count is 2 mm. The diameter of the base and the height is both measured to be 20. So D comma H, they are both equal to 20 centimeters. And the least count is actually 2 mm. The maximum percentage error in the determination of volume. So now, now most people, what they did is they actually wrote V as 1 by 3 pi R squared H. And then they figured out DV by V equals 2 delta R by R plus delta H by H. And the logic that they used was delta Delta R by R uh, would be the same as Delta D by D. And then what they did is instead of Delta R, they put 2 mm, which would actually be wrong. Okay. okay, first I'll explain the correct way. So in the correct way, we'll obviously put Delta D by D here. And as D and H are both same, Delta D and Delta H are also same. I can group these terms together. So this will be three times, two mm is 0.2 centimeters divided by 20 centimeter times 100. And the correct answer will turn out to be 3%. And if you did the Delta R by R thing, then you'll get 5%. Okay, that is actually wrong. I'll take an example to explain you why that is wrong. Okay, so this is a very common experiment. So assume that we have a pendulum okay uh, that is oscillating and and the time taken for five complete oscillations was reported to be 12.6 seconds uh, plus or minus 0.2 seconds so the 12.6 uh, seconds is the best value and there is also an uncertainty of 0.2 seconds so what that means is in the worst possible situation t max can be 12.8 seconds at the highest and the minimum case 12.4 seconds. So this is the variation. So the actual value is going to be in between 12.8 and 12.4. Now the thing is guys, let's say we want to figure out the time it takes for one oscillation. Now observe something, this is exactly the same as this question, right? 
Uh, here information for diameter is given, right? It is 20 centimeters plus or minus 0.2 centimeters. Okay, and then we want to figure out what is the radius. Okay, so this question is exactly identical to the first question. So here guys, uh, what is the time for one oscillation? So we'll take the best possible time, which is 12.6 seconds, divided by five. And this comes out to be 2.52 seconds. So now if you do T max by five, this turns out to be 2.56 seconds. And if you do T minimum by five, this is 12.4 by five, which comes out to be 2.48 seconds. Okay, so now the time taken for one oscillation, let's say it is T star, it would be equal to the best value, which is 2.52 seconds, plus or minus, this is 2.52 plus 0 0.04, this is 2.52 minus 0 0.04. Here the uncertainty is 0 0.04 seconds. Okay, it's not the same as 0 0.2 seconds. So if you divide a quantity by, or multiply a quantity by a factor, then the uncertainty also gets divided by that fraction, right? Initially, the uncertainty was 0.2 and now the uncertainty is 0.04. Yes, the relative error is still the same. So if you say delta T by T, this would be the same as delta T star upon T star. And this is what a lot of people actually made the mistake here. They, they wrote delta D by D and they assume that it is the same as delta R by R. This is correct. But then they assume delta R is the same as delta D, which is wrong. In fact, if you observe delta R from here, it is just delta D by two, right? If you put D equals two R, so this will actually be one mm. Uh, so yeah, that was it for this question. The answer would be 3%. Okay guys, so that was it for this video. The rest of the problems we'll solve in the next video. And yeah, if you enjoyed the video, please do like, share and subscribe. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching.